Grace and peace to you, church. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is so very good to gather with you in worship this morning here in this space and those of you worshiping online. It is good to be the church with all of you. I invite you, before we begin worship, to take some time and look at the announcements and the prayer list on the back of your bulletin. Several things there. Um, especially want to invite you next Sunday. We are celebrating All Saints Sunday as well as Communion Sunday. And that is a day where we remember those who have died in the last year and all those that we carry on our hearts. And we celebrate the wonder, the gift of the whole communion of God's saints that we are all a part of. So it's a wonderful Sunday. Every Sunday is a good Sunday to invite someone to church, <laughs> but that one especially is a beautiful and meaningful, um, even more so, moment in the life of faith here at Amity. So please think to invite someone who might want to come, might have somebody special that they want to remember in a special way during worship. Um, but as always, invite someone every Sunday. <laughs> it's good to see all of you this morning. Beloveds, we are here to worship God. So I invite you to settle your racing, busy thoughts, your busy bodies, calm your hearts and minds, and turn them to thoughts of God as the 11 o'clock hour is chimed. Beloveds, let's rise and call one another to worship. You'll see in your bulletin there's just one line, and that is your line that says... Hmm? I'm supposed to pray. Oh, let's pray first. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> God of transformation, yeah. transform us today as we worship together. Open us up to hear and receive your word, to pray and sing with one another, and to be changed by an encounter with you the living God. By the power of your Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear, wisdom to understand, and courage to answer your call to us today. Amen. Amen. Now, <laughs> let's call one another to worship. Your words are, we want to see Jesus. When I go like this, that's your turn. It's that simple. Children of God, why have you come here today? We want Jesus. Alongside those searching for healing and hope, we want to see Jesus. With those who have been pushed aside, with the lonely and the lost, we want to see Jesus. With those who seek mystery and meaning, belonging and grace, we want to see Jesus. Church, open your eyes and you will see him. Open your hearts, and you will be seen. Let's lift our voices in praise to God with how firm a foundation, hymn 361. How firm a foundation Oh! <laughs> 
grace shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flesh shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath laid for repose, I will not, I will not deserve to its foes. The soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Please be seated. Beloveds, beloveds of God, with all our trying and our seeking, all our attempts to live right, to believe right, sometimes we get it wrong, don't we? Sometimes, no matter what, we get things wrong. But the good news is that we can bring that to God. We don't even have to bring it to God. Jesus meets us right where we are, right in the middle of all of it. And Jesus meets us with grace and with love. So trusting in that grace and love, we offer our confession to God this morning. First, we will sing together, then pray aloud together, then pray in silence. Let us sing our prayer. Listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us Together we pray, living God, sometimes we cannot see you. We search for you and have to strain to hear your voice. And yet you come to us where we are. You find us even in our sinful lives. You forgive us and change our hearts through the grace of your son, Jesus, and his liberating love. Forgive us and turn us around again. Amen. Friends, the scriptures tell us that no matter where we are, no matter how high or low or near or far, no matter what, God's love will find us. God's love will draw clear, draw near and close to us and make us new again. Friends, let's speak together the assurance of grace. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, 
we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. As the children come forward, I invite you to sing the good news. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you today? Good, good. We have a fun story this morning from the Bible that I want to tell you. It is a story of a man with a really funny name. You want to hear it? No, that's good. That is another funny name, but that's not the funny name that we're talking about today. The funny name is Zacchaeus. It's not as funny as you thought. Well, I think it's funny. <laughs> it's like Zac, Zacchaeus. Yeah. And scripture says that Zacchaeus saw that Jesus was traveling through a place called Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Put that in your pocket. Um, is, hold on. Listen to this story. I want you to hear the story because you are very important. And this is really good news, okay? Both of you. All right. Jesus was traveling through Jericho, and a man named Zacchaeus really wanted to see him. He wanted to see Jesus. He just wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. But there were all of these crowds around Jesus. And the Bible tells us that there was a problem. There was a reason that Zacchaeus could not see through all those crowds. He wasn't blind. That's a good guess. He was short. <laughs> the crowds were tall. And Zacchaeus was not a very tall person, right? People come in all sizes, don't they? And they're all beautiful. But he was too short to see over the crowds. He was a wee little man. Zacchaeus, so he ran ahead. Hmm? No, he just was short. He ran ahead of the crowd, okay? And he really wanted to see. And he saw a tree, a sycamore tree. And he climbed up in that tree. And he climbed all the way up to see if he could see Jesus when he passed by. And here's what you need, another thing you need to know about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had a certain job. He was a tax collector. Taxes are like when you pay money. You know what taxes are? Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you guys are well versed in the economics, right? All right. So Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which means that he collected money from the people and gave it to the government. Now, people didn't really like that very much, okay? Because they didn't really like the government at that time of Rome, okay? And so, they were not happy with the tax collectors. They thought, ugh, that guy, he's despicable. They weren't big fans of him. But he still wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed up in the sycamore tree, and Jesus passed by right under the tree. And he's looking, and he's looking, and he's looking. And Jesus stops right under the tree, and he looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus looks. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry down out of that tree, because I am coming to your house today. Do you think he was surprised? Yeah, he was surprised. He didn't know he was going to host Jesus. But he was super excited, and he hurried down out of the tree, and he was ready to go with Jesus. But do you know what? All those crowds who, what, they didn't like tax collectors, right? They looked at him, and they saw Jesus inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house, and they said, what? This guy, he eats with sinners, like the wrong people. I said, how come that guy is hosting Jesus? Jesus must be, hmm. We got some questions about this guy who eats with tax collectors and goes to their house. Well, Zacchaeus turns around and he says, hold on. Lord, he talks to Jesus and he talks to the people. He says, I give away half of everything that I have. I give it to the poor. And if I ever cheat somebody, I pay them back 
four times over. Four times over. He speaks up. And then Jesus says, Today, salvation has come to your house, Zacchaeus, because you are a child of Abraham. That means you are a child of God. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> and then they went. It's a pretty cool story. Now, here's, I got a challenge for you guys. Okay? A challenge, two challenges. One, the first one is, Jesus saw Zacchaeus with different eyes. He saw him through his eyes of love and grace. So everybody else saw Zacchaeus, and they just saw a mean, dishonest tax collector, but Jesus saw him and saw a child of God, right? He saw who he really is, really was. And he loved him that way. So that's what we're going to try to do in our daily lives. You listening? We try to see people like Jesus sees them with eyes of love and not necessarily believe what other people say or assume about somebody, okay? And then, okay, so that's the first challenge. Second challenge, this one, this is really important, okay? And, it, and it's like two parts. You got to remember next week, okay? Zacchaeus gave away half of his possessions to folks who didn't, who were in need, folks who didn't have things. What is tomorrow? What holiday? It's Monday, but what Monday? Yep, it's Halloween. Do you go trick-or-treating? Yes. Yeah. You do too, Dylan? Okay. And what do you get on, on Halloween when you go trick-or-treating? Candy. candy. Right? I love candy. Mm -hmm. mm, we'll see about that. I love candy too. <laughs> now, we say in the church, when we have things, when we are blessed, we give some of that away, just like Zacchaeus did. We give some away. We bring it to those who don't have anything. So... It's, it's tough to do. I'm going to ask you guys something. <laughs> Next week, I want you to choose some of your candy, okay, to bring back to worship. And guess who we're going to give it to, who you are going to give it to. We have a Wednesday food ministry every week where people come and get food, and there's lots of kids that come. Mm, hold on. There's lots of kids that come through, and it would be wonderful, are you listening, to be able to give them some candy that we share, okay? Now, you guys don't have lots of money. People give their money. They give their possessions. But you got candy, or you will tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I want you to think about that this week and think. Get a little box or a bag, okay, and put some candy aside to give away as much as you want, as much as you can. That's for you to take home today, okay? But next week, I want you to bring it back to worship, and we're going to offer it to God for those in need, okay? <laughs> All right. You got to help you remember. You guys help me remember. All right. Let's say a prayer. Are you ready? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for seeing us with eyes of love. Help us to do the same. And help us to share the blessings we have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks for spending time up here with me. Think about that story of Zacchaeus as you listen during worship, okay? You can go back to the playground.
Our Old Testament scripture today comes from the prophet of Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it is actually 1061, 1061 in the pew Bible. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. We go from the prophets to the Gospels. To the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Listen again to the story of Zacchaeus and Jesus. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of God, and it is for us, the people of God. God. Like many homes with young children, Ours this week has been a flurry of holiday preparation. There was digging through the box of costumes from Halloween's past to see, you know, with high hopes that something could be used to be transformed into a costume for this year. There was lots of hot glue and glitter. And then some giving up and ordering from Amazon. Davy insisted on having fake spider webs out front. So we spent an evening stretching those over top the real spider webs on our front porch. And then, <laughs> don't tell. And then last night, we transformed two big orange pumpkins into glowing jack o' lanterns, grinning into the darkness. 
And like always, I am sure that tomorrow we'll remember at the last minute that we forgot to buy candy for the trick-or-treaters, and then we'll go spend way too much money on whatever is still left at the store before finally sending our own little ghouls out into the night on their epic quest for sugar. I love Halloween. (laughs) I always have childlike joy and the silliness, the surprises, the sense of community. It's a day when even middle schoolers who have become too cool for such childish things on most other days, they remember how fun it can still be. And the creativity you see on Halloween. When else do you see Your average middle-aged men suddenly become hometown Hollywood set designers, masters of special effects and jump scares. There was a woman that I used to work with at a previous church here in Charlotte. She was the kindest, she is the kindest, gentlest woman 364 days a year. But on Halloween... She transforms herself into the scariest, meanest, wartiest witch that you have ever seen. And kids come from all over Charlotte to her front yard to test their courage (laughs) and be rewarded with candy from the witch's cauldron. All in good fun, of course. Depending on which church in which Christian denomination you pay attention to, you'll hear all kinds of different things about Halloween. In some churches, Halloween is something to battle against. People are afraid that it celebrates evil, celebrates the occult. Some Christian churches ignore the holiday completely. It isn't really a Christian holiday anyway. But a celebration with deep roots, that may well come from folk traditions, traditions of honoring the dead or appeasing evil spirits or marking the end of the summer harvest and the beginning of the darkest days of the year. Liturgically, that is in the context of organized worship in the church, the Christian church turns more towards All Saints Day and that day celebrated on the first day in November, just as we will celebrate here next Sunday. On All Saints Day, we remember those who have died and we proclaim their place and our own in the great communion of God's saints throughout time and place. It's a beautiful, powerful witness. And I do hope that you'll be here and bring a friend. But we aren't to All Saints Sunday yet. That's next Sunday. Tomorrow is Halloween. (laughs) And while it may not be a Christian holiday, it is an opportunity to be the church wherever we are. Many churches have recognized that opportunity. The opportunity that it presents to welcome their neighbors. They have trunk or treats in their parking lots or fall festivals like we had a couple years ago in the before times, before COVID, right? (laughs) Last year, Halloween was on a Sunday, and that day at Amity in worship was full of characters. Wonder Woman, a tiny little farmer, Little Red Riding Hood, there were a couple clowns. Mr. Incredible and Baby Xavier Incredible were here, and even a giant singing crescent moon. No one really knows who that was in that costume to this day. So many others gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It was joyful. It was welcoming things the church should strive to be, right? So maybe Halloween does have something to teach us Christians about how to live like Jesus. As I read somewhere this week, Maybe Halloween is the day that we actually get it right. Strangers come knocking at our door. They come beautiful, ugly, odd, scary, and we accept them all without question. We compliment them, 
Treat them kindly and give them good things. Why don't we live like that? <laughs> Childlike joy. Childlike joy and wonder. This world, this word childlike, it has come up in a variety of places this week. If you remember last Sunday, we wrapped up the gospel reading with Jesus' command to let the children come to him because it is to them that the kingdom of God belongs. And after his parable about the pious Pharisee and the repentant tax collector, Jesus said, we've got to receive God's kingdom like a child. We've got to receive it as the utter gift that it is. Like children who simply rely on and trust others to love and care for them without the illusion that they can earn any of it. Then at the Presbytery meeting, some of you were at on Tuesday, we heard a powerful sermon on this passage from the Reverend Matt Connor at Newell Presbyterian Church. And he called on the pastors and the elders that were present there to be childish in their faith, to come to God with wonder, to carry out their ministry as children carry out their days, asking nonstop questions. In particular, when it comes to being the church, Reverend Connor encouraged us to ask why a hundred times before asking what. Be childish, church, he said. <laughs> and all through this week, I've been carrying with me today's gospel story of Zacchaeus. A story that for me and for lots of other people who grew up in the church, it brings up memories of childhood Sunday school classes and silly songs. I bet some of you were already singing it as soon as you heard the name Zacchaeus was wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? <laughs> this story, it's one that children learn early on. Maybe you know it really well, having heard it many, many times over the years. And sometimes, when we know a Bible story really well like that, especially if it's one that we associate with childhood, we tend to close our ears a bit. We close our ears to anything new that the Spirit has to teach us through the story. Subconsciously, we feel like we understand it already. It's somewhat ironic that this becomes one of those stories because this is a story about seeing. Everyone in this story sees something new. And we are invited to open our childlike eyes and do the same. So church, let's begin with Zacchaeus himself. What did he see? He realized that Jesus was going to be passing by his way, on his way to Jerusalem, and he wanted to see Jesus. There's nothing remarkable about that. Plenty of people wanted to see Jesus, but Zacchaeus wasn't just anyone. He was a tax collector and a rich tax collector at that. That means he was not particularly well liked among his community because he collect taxes, collected taxes on behalf of the Roman government, the same Roman government that was engaged in the oppression of Jews and the occupation of their land. He was seen as a collaborator with the enemy and apparently he collaborated well enough to become wealthy doing it. So here is this despised but wealthy tax collector trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. But he can't see, <laughs> because apparently he is also quite short. And the crowds that have gathered around Jesus, they are in the way of his seeing. He desperately wants to see Jesus, but he can't, because there's something in the way. I have been there with Zacchaeus. Have you? But in his desperation, he runs ahead. <laughs> he runs ahead of the crowds and he climbs up into a sycamore tree, hoping to at least get a glimpse of Jesus as he passes by. I love to imagine this scene. A grown man 
hitching up wore probably very expensive robes and running red-faced to the nearest tree that could support his weight and, and then in a way most unbecoming to a dignified agent of Rome. He grabs, climbs, and scooches his way up into the branches, peering down at the approaching crowd with wide-eyed expectation. It's childish. It's undignified. But he wants to see Jesus. And sometimes that means looking like a fool to everyone else. Well, it works. Not in the way Zacchaeus thinks, though. Much to his surprise and his joy, Jesus stops right in front of his tree. And he looks up at him and he calls him by name, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. He wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus sees him. He sees him in this undignified, ridiculous, childish position. In his seeking, he is seen. In his pursuing of the Lord, he realizes that the Lord is pursuing him. <clears throat> and it's not happening from some distant, polite place either. That's not how Jesus does things, is it? He invites himself to your house for dinner, and he doesn't give you any time to clean up your mess. It's almost as if we won't see Jesus. We won't see anything of worth and beauty in this life unless we allow ourselves to be seen too. So Jesus calls to Zacchaeus, and Scripture says he doesn't just cautiously climb down out of the tree. He comes down at once. He hurries down. He scrambles out of the tree with delight, filled with joy to take Jesus home with him. This little detail, it got me asking about joy. Does the word joy characterize my faith? I love and I honor God. But does the mere thought of God put a smile on my face? How about you? When did Jesus last delight your soul? I said, <clears throat> I think that this story is about seeing. Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but much to his surprise, Jesus sees Zacchaeus. But there's others in this story who learn to see. When it becomes clear that Zacchaeus the wealthy tax collector, the enemy collaborator, the grown fool who ran and climbed a tree, when it becomes clear that he is going to host Jesus in his home, well, the crowds start talking, as they often do. <laughs> they start grumbling about Jesus being the guest of a sinner. They think that they have seen all they need to see about Zacchaeus. They know who he is. They know what kind of life he leads, because all those tax collectors are the same. Right? Hmm. Another great detail in this story is that it's not just, it's not Jesus who speaks up against their grumbling and their accusations, it's Zacchaeus himself. He stands up right then and there, and he speaks boldly to Jesus and all who can hear and say, and says, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I pay them back four times over. And if you know the story, you're thinking, that's not what it says. It says, I will, right? I will give half my possessions. I will pay them back. 
That's the traditional translation here from the Greek. It says that I will give. But that will, it's assumed. In the Greek text, it's not a future tense. It's present. I give. I give half my possessions to the poor. If I cheat anyone, I give them, I pay them back four times over. That little detail changes the story, doesn't it? It invites us to hear it, to see it in a different light, to see Zacchaeus in a different light. And Zacchaeus, when he challenges the crowd's assumptions, he challenges their condemnation. They are telling a story about him that isn't as true as they think. The name Zacchaeus, it means righteous. And he lets them know that he is doing his very best to live up to it. Taking seriously the words of the prophet Isaiah that we heard today, who says that the Lord has no use for empty offerings of just gold, just rituals. The offerings that the Lord wants is to give our resources to the poor, to give what we have to those in need, to defend the powerless and the vulnerable with honesty. It's as if he says, my name is Zacchaeus, and I am not who you all say I am. I am trying my best to be the person that Jesus sees me to be. And across these 2,000 years or so, maybe he's still saying that to us. I'm not just the repentant sinner that you keep saying that I am. I'm also a righteous and generous man, wrongly condemned by my prejudiced neighbors. Maybe... And hearing Zacchaeus speak, speak for himself, tell his own story. Maybe for the first time the crowds realize how limited their vision really is. Maybe they catch their first real glimpse of Zacchaeus through the eyes of Jesus. Maybe for a moment at least, the crowds, the people, maybe they stop holding him hostage to a version of himself that he has outgrown, or that maybe he never was in the first place. It's easy to be blinded by our prejudice of those people, isn't it? But on this day, under a sycamore tree, they get to meet the Zacchaeus that Jesus knew all along, a beloved son of Abraham, living as good a life as he knows how, which is all any of us can do, right? C.S. Lewis, he writes about how everyone that we meet, every uninteresting person, has the potential to one day be someone that we will worship or that we will fear. And that in, an, in our interactions with them, we are in some way helping them along to either of those destinations. I quote, he says, It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Hmm. When we encounter people, we encounter all that they have been made to be, all that they are yet to be. 
How different would our lives be if we lived them as Lewis describes? To see ourselves and to see others. Everyone we encounter as Jesus sees. That is to glimpse the extraordinary and the immortal <laughs> at all times. The image of God at all times. It's breathtaking. When you think about it, I can hardly wrap my mind around what that means. But that's the kind of seeing that we are called into in this life. So if you doubt it, consider this. In all of our seeking, Jesus is the one who finds us. In all of our determined climbing, Jesus invites us to climb back down and stand face to face with salvation. In all of our running ahead, it's easy to forget who we and others truly are. But Jesus reminds us always. And when we are reminded, when we remember who we truly are and whose we truly are, we discover the amazing truth that Zacchaeus discovered. Jesus has already followed us home. Alleluia. Amen. Beloveds, it is good and right and faithful to pray with and for one another, with and for the world. I will guide us in prayer, but there will be time for you to speak your prayers as well. So in that moment, you are invited to speak aloud your prayer requests. Name those on your heart, the situations, the places, the celebrations. Whatever you have on your heart today, you are welcome to speak it to God and before one another as we pray together. Let us pray. <sighs> Loving God. You call us by name, and we are so grateful. You invite us to abide with you, and we thank you for that gift. We thank you for the gift of community, for the connections that are made and strengthened in the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation today and every day. We thank you for meeting our needs and granting us joy. We thank you for sycamore trees, for pollinating bees, and for the foods that fill our bodies and delight our senses, for the ways that we enjoy the abundance of your creation. Lord, we give you thanks. And still, Lord, we recognize that many in the world are not so well fed. That there are too many who go to sleep with empty stomachs in unsafe places. And our hearts grieve with those who are recovering from devastation, from natural disasters that we seem to keep making worse. Lord, we pray for all who struggle. We thank you for the gift of community, for family, for loved ones, for the ways in which our lives are enriched by others. We give you thanks. Lord, we ask you to help us see. See the others in our lives, the others who we cross paths with. Help us to see them as you see them. Help us to speak life and love and growth into them instead of harm. Lord, we pray for those who are lonely, those who have lost loved ones or experiencing separation or distance. We pray for those caught in cycles 
cycles of addiction, cycles of abuse. We pray for those struggling with mental health of any kind and for those in crisis. Lord, help us to learn to accompany and to care for each other, grounded in your love. We thank you for the ways that you allow us to flourish and grow. And we pray for peace and justice to overcome violence here and around the world, to overcome oppression, injustice in our communities around the world. Lord, may we be instruments of your peace and messengers of your love. Lord, we offer the people and the situations and the places that are on our hearts today, we offer them to you in faith and trust and hope in this moment. children. Lord, help us to trust. Help us to trust that the prayers of our hearts rise to you and fall on your ears like beautiful music. Help us, Lord, to keep singing. And now we join our voices in prayer to you using the words of our family prayer, the words that Jesus gave us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Corinth in 2 Corinthians 9.11. He said, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Mm -hmm. Today, we're also, besides collecting the offering, we're collecting the 10 cent a meal. So if you've got a, a check to put in there, that would be great. Which um, you can give to God online through our church website or in the offering plate, which is at the back of the sanctuary as you leave. No matter how you give to God, give with joy and trust in our God who loves us so much. Also, I will ask the choir to come up and help us lead in the last hymn, which will be uh, number 441. If you'll please stand, I love thy kingdom, Lord.
Friends, Jesus calls us today and says, hurry, come down and receive the abundant love and grace of God. and Be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, salvation has come to this house today. Thanks be to God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our divine parent and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and go with us today and always. Amen. Go and know God holds you, the Holy Spirit's with you, and Jesus loves you. Holy Spirit's with you.